If sea level rises and floods low-lying poor countries like Bangladesh, they don't have the resources to do something about that. If, you know, if, if the sea level rises and, and threatens Manhattan, America is rich enough to build a wall around it. Bangladesh is not. So it's going to be the world's poorest. It's going to be the usual victims will suffer the consequences. I'm well aware that I'm going to die, and I know that all of you here are going to die. But it's no cause for concern or, 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 or pessimism. It's just an inevitable thing, thing that, that is bound to happen. And so it is with the change that's happened to the, happening to the Earth now. Well, a pessimist or a realist, the choice is yours. But I'm looking for some cause for optimism as we look forward. My biggest concern is world population growth. Explosion would be a better, better word. I mean, 6.7 billion now, somewhere about 8 point something by 2030, and then ever upwards. How are we going to find the water? How are we going to find food? How are we going to find energy? And of course, climate crisis. I don't like the phrase climate change or global warming. These sound like euphemisms for an extreme weather future that is going to cause us serious problems. Ray, we've heard an awful lot of doom and gloom. Should we walk away from this in a, in a, in a very pessimistic frame of mind? Definitely not. The whole of human history shows that life gets better over time. If we think of where the human race was 100 years ago, 200 years ago, imagine the difference. And now, of course, because of the speed of technology development, life in 25 years for most of us in the world is going to be much better than today. The joker in the pack is technology development. Our lives today are shaped by technology. And the speed of technology development is such that in 25 years' time, we will be on the brink of having computers as clever as we are, and then twice as clever, and then four times as clever. These machines, under our control, will help us to solve the world's problems and give us an ever better life. So if I say to you, nine billion people by 2030, you say what? an ever-growing consumer market that we have to find the water, energy and food for. If I say to you, to the north, an escalating race for energy resources, you say... There is energy all around us. We have energy from the sun every day that could, if it were properly harnessed, provide all the energy we need. If I say to you, to the south, riots on the streets over the prices of food, you say? Well, the food crisis is man-made. We can solve it within a season or two. There is an awful lot of suspicion around the very term GM. Is it time to abandon that technology? No, why on earth would you suggest we should? I mean, most of the suspicion about GM is in Europe. And that goes back to the 1990s when the environmental groups waged a very successful campaign against altering genetic modified plants. In fact, it can bring enormous benefits and help to feed millions of people in areas where other crops would not grow. An endorsement which would of course be welcomed by the big GM companies. Two years ago, when we spoke to the CEO of Monsanto, he said that he was keenly aware that controversy came hand in hand with introducing new technology. For any new technology, there's always controversy and there's always some fear associated with it. And frankly, given the choice, I'd rather be first in the field with some controversy than fourth or fifth and invisible. I think that's just the price of, uh, of being first sometimes. I think the focus for a company like mine is what's the scientific regulatory process and that allows us then to file submissions and hopefully see them progressing through that queue. When nothing happens, I, I think scientifically that's a very frightening environment because there literally is no, no progress. And the fact that technology is bringing about change also gives hope to some of the other people that we've heard from. When we think about the message to the public for climate change, it shouldn't all be doom and gloom. I think that we should try to communicate that by using our intelligence, using what we've already invested in, in, in science, 
using what we've learned, we can begin to develop uh, technologies and approaches that, that will, uh, will help us deal with our future. I think we have to use this time right now to get very serious about long-term solutions. And by the way, farmers in Ireland, who 150 years ago had a famine, farmers in Sweden, who were very poor 150 years ago, farmers in Vietnam, have all been overcoming the hunger and poverty trap. So the world knows how to do this, and we have to help those in Asia, Africa, and Latin America who want to have that uh, advantage also um, be able to do that. Every country really depends on its leadership. Either that or the population then decides that the leaders are not taking them anywhere and they, talk, they take things into their own hands and we have revolutions. Now, I don't think we want a revolution. Well, in terms of the average person, you can do small things, but the truth is there's very little. You, know, you can try to reduce your carbon footprint. You can try to eat less meat or, uh, or eat meat that's lower down the food chain, right? You know, chicken is not as damaging to the planet as beef. But governments can, uh, can try to uh, make the prices that rich country residents face reflect the true burden on the planet. That means, above all, some kind of carbon taxation or carbon cap and trade, but some, something that makes the price of driving a large automobile um, reflect the actual cost that imposes on the planet. Very, very difficult to do uh, as, a, as a political matter, but the economics is not hard. It's only the politics that's hard. It'll only be horrible for those people who do not listen and do not move. You see, lots of the Earth will still be very inhabitable. Um, not 10 years, even 40 years' time, even long into the future. The Arctic Basin, Canada, Siberia, islands like the United Kingdom, um, New Zealand, um, Tasmania, and others will be very inhabitable and quite pleasant, and people will live there. And there'll be oases on the continents. Uh, there will be oases in Europe. There will be all sorts of places where people can lead a happy and fulfilling life once they've settled down. It'll, but uh, it's going to be very sad for the rest. But the rest were doomed to die anyway. There are just m far more of us on the Earth than the, the planet can support. Well, over the course of this programme, we've seen and heard from some of the world's leading figures whose stated goals are to safeguard our survival. They are amazing people doing amazing things, but one thing is abundantly clear. If we want to survive, we must all play a role in helping to protect our planet. For more on the spirit of survival, go to cnn.com spirit.